as we sing. Glory, hallelujah, I shall not be moved. Anchored in Jehovah, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the waters, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the waters, I shall not be moved. Amen. You may be seated. There are many things in this life that can move us away from our dedication to Christ and our walk with Him. But if you are grounded in God's Word, if you are submitted to the Holy Spirit, if you're being compelled forward by what God would have you to do, you shall not be moved. Uh, because greater is He who is in you than he who is in the world, as the Scripture says. And so we are overcomers because of Christ living in us. Not because of ourselves but because of Jesus. So it's good to have you here this morning uh, for this worship service on this beautiful summer Sunday morning. So we welcome you to Beulah Baptist Church. Uh, if you are a newcomer, I'd like for you, if you would, uh, to fill out one of the little blue cards that's in the pew rack and put your name on that and the other information that's requested. And we're not going to put you on a mailing list or anything like that, but we do want to express to you how glad we were to have you here today. So if you fill that out, that would certainly help us, and then we can get in touch with you. So we just hope that you are blessed through everything that takes place here this morning. And before we go any further, we just want to offer up this whole service to God in prayer. So let's pray together. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful day that you've given us. And Father, it just makes the day complete when we come together with your people to worship you. So, Father, we thank you for this opportunity to sing together, to fellowship with one another, to enjoy one another's company. Father, we thank you for the precious gift of your word. And we pray that as we hear that through song and through the, the spoken word, that you would just use it to touch our hearts and transform our minds. Father, we pray especially for anyone here this morning who may not know Christ. May that person say, Lord, forgive me of my sin, come into my heart and make me the new person that only you can. Father, just lead us and guide us in all that we undertake here this morning, and we will be faithful to give you the credit and the acknowledgement for everything that's accomplished. For it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen. Let's continue on with our service and stand and sing, I am so happy. Stand as we sing. I'm so Amen. You may be seated. At this time, Jay is going to come and share our announcements. Morning. Good morning. All right. We've got our Father's Day, let's see, cookout this year is what it's going to be. It's going to be on June 23rd, 6 p.m. That's that Friday there. We've got the sign-up sheets in the back for that. So, guys, if you can sign up, you're going to come for that. Be up to the Tiger Lake Pavilion, so uh, be aware of that. And then, ladies, uh, they'll need some help there. So if you can see Pam Thorne, I guess there's also a sign-up sheet there, too, for you, if you can, if you'd rather do that. And then uh, we got our Vacation Bible School quickly approaching. You saw how the little the tents forming there on the side of the road, and it's going to be a little fireplace over there. Get us a little uh, free side of the road advertising. Scotty's got a, uh, it's going real good there. We've got a work night on the 16th this friday coming up 6 p.m and we're also asking for christmas trees so if you got a you know these artificial christmas trees we can borrow 
Uh, we'll uh, take some of those. You can put them over in the, the ministry center there. Also, the, speaking of the ministry center, some, still some coolers from uh, uh, Memorial Day over there, I noticed. So you can, you know, be sure to pick those up. But the Christmas trees, yeah, we can, so we can, uh, you know, it's the camping thing, so we're going to decorate in there with uh, uh, trees all over the place. So if we can borrow that, that'd be great. And, uh, you know, we'll see about getting the big tall one there, like the 20-foot one from the, Washington, the National Mall, right? Yeah, Scotty wasn't listening, so she didn't hear that. <laughs> no, 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 don't, don't worry. The big tall one from the National Mall for a Christmas tree. No? Oh, okay. <laughs> so, all right, let's see here. Moving right along on your insert there, you'll see some stuff with uh, the bingo prizes for uh, that's up at the nursing home there. So if you can help out with that, there's some totes uh, around in the various areas. We've got Camp Cowan going on. Uh, and then there's a message in there with Operation Christmas Child, so be ready for that. And then there's this uh, Russian missions fundraiser that's coming up here. And I think Christy's going to come up and talk about that and then read scripture for us if Jack cooperates. Jack might be, a, well, yeah, that's why we're talking about it. <laughs> All right, Jack's going to come sing in the choir. Okay. So on Tuesday at our house, mine and Jay's house. So if you don't know, if you want to come and you don't know where we live, just let us know. We'll give you directions. We're really easy to find. But we are having um, a fundraiser for the Russia Missions Partnership through the West Virginia Baptist Convention. Did I get that right? <laughs> it's a lot of words. <laughs> I've really been practicing. Um, <laughs> so anyway, it is a, a Pampered Chef um, event. But what happens is, typically, if you're familiar with Pampered Chef. The host usually gets free and discounted products, but when we do a fundraiser in lieu of the free and discounted, Pamper Chef makes a donation to whatever organization um, you're with. So in this case, it's the Russia Missions fundraiser is what we're doing. So we're gonna make some yummy food. We're gonna get out the indoor outdoor grill, which is new, and the ice cream maker, which is new. We've tried it out at my house a couple times and it's always a big hit. So um, it'll be a lot of fun. Everybody will get to get together and get your hands on this stuff. <laughs> um, and then the, like I said, Paper Chef will then make a donation to the um, West Virginia Baptist Convention Russia Missions Partnership. Any questions about that? It's kind of a quick rundown. Is there anything I'm missing? Yes, there's uh, these catalogs. What are these oh, yeah. all about? <laughs> I forgot about that. I'm like, make sure you announce these catalogs. I had this all planned out, and then he's throwing me for a loop. So if you're not able to come, um, but you still want to place an order, I do have catalogs with me. Or if you are willing to take catalogs to work with you or to pass around to other people you know, fundraisers work best when there's a lot of people who are out and about collecting orders and passing, passing things around. So it is a big collective big collective effort. So if you're willing to do that, let me know. I have some extra ones with me and just pass them around this week and we'll try to have the orders in by the end of the week. Um, but just keep me updated on that if you need a, an extra day or two. But anyway, so if you want to take catalogs to work, let me know. And the link's on the... And the link, there is an online link. It's on the bottom of the fundraiser... Insert. Insert, thank you. <laughs> All right, now you want to read scripture? So then he said, do you want to read scripture? And Wait a minute. Oh, wait, wait, I got, got out of order here. Okay, we got to do birthdays first, yeah, you know. We usually get this out of the way in our practice service early, but, you know, we're just... <laughs> so uh, we got Diane Cox, Angie McVicker, Chase Rogers, Nathan Castle, Jason Davis, Pauline Stevens, and Haley Biggins. Uh, also, anniversaries, David and Jeannie Best, they were last week, and we missed them, so we got them this week, and Doug and Monica Robinson. Now, we did notice that Pastor and Jeannie had their picture up from when they got married. We noticed that pastor's a redhead. <laughs> so we've had fun with that. All right, there we go. Moving right along, right? Okay, scripture reading. Hey, there you go. Okay. <laughs> okay, the scripture comes out of Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, 
For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. All right, thank you, Christy. And if our ushers will come, we'll take up our morning offering. Terry Mayfield, if you'd pray for the offering, please. Amen. Uh, this time we have a special from the choir.
Thank you, choir. Uh, at this high time, we're happy to have the sessions with us. They're going to come and share a couple songs. Somebody other than the pianist, can they tell me what the offertory hymn was? Beulah Land. Beulah Land. You know who wrote that? <coughs> Squire Parsons. Well, we just happen to have another song by Squire Parsons that's become one of our favorites, and we hope you enjoy it too. It talks about not giving up. Old West Virginia Hillbilly. Well, I'm not giving up. No, I'm not turning around. By the grace of God, I'll win a shining crown someday. Well, I'll be holding on to that nail scarred hand. I'm not giving up, no, I'll keep going on. Now I've been a walking through the valley, through this old vale of tears. At times I've even questioned, even if my Lord was near. And many times that old tender. He said, Jay, why don't you just turn around? You can't get any farther. You're just a losing ground. But I'm not giving up. No, I'm not turning, turning around. By the grace of God, I'll win a shining crown someday. That nail scarred hand. I'm not giving up. No, I'll keep going on. Now, would you mind just to tell me? Oh, there's been something just bothering me. Why is it that old devil just won't let God's children be? You see, he has purpose and determined. He's gonna get right in our way and turn us from the way of life and try to lead our souls astray. But I'm not giving up. No, I'm not turning turn around. By the grace of God, I'll win a shining crown someday. Well, I'll keep a holding on to that nail scarred hand. I'm not giving up, no, I'll keep going on. I'm not giving up, no, I'm Turning round by the grace of God, I'll win a shining crown someday. Well, I'll keep a holding on to that nail scarred hand. I'm not giving up, no, I'm not going, giving up, no. I'm not turning round By the grace of God I'll win a shining crown Someday Well, I'll keep holding on Holding on To that nail-scarred hand I'm not giving up No, I'll keep going on 
never give up. You know, in Matthew, the ninth chapter, the 23rd, uh, 37th verse, it says, the house is full, but the workers are few. James 2.20 says, for with the works is dead. Faith without works is dead. God is trying to find those that will be a witness for him. How can you be a witness? I've found a way that makes it easy. Every time I see a penny on the ground, I pick it up. And I've had people say, do you pick up pennies? I said, yeah, because it reminds me. Right on the front, it says, in God we trust. That's where my trust is. And it gives me a chance to witness with a penny. God will give you an opportunity if you just ask him. And then he'll also give you the words to say that might just lead somebody to Christ. Father said, my house is full, but I have very few workers. Would you be willing to be a worker for him? contentment in the Father's house today. Lots of food on his table and no one is turned away. And there is singing and laughter as the hours pass by. But a hush comes the singing as the father sadly cries. My house is full, but my field is empty. Children all want to stay around my table, but no one wants to work in my field. Push away from the table, look out through the window pane. Just beyond this house of plenty lies a field of gold and grain. And it's right onto the harvest. But the reapers, where are they? In the house, oh, count the children. Hear the father sadly say. Children all want to stay around my table, 
But no one wants to work in my field. No one wants to work in my field. Go and work in my field. The question for today. Thank you to the sessions. We're always glad to have them with us. Let's take our hymnals and turn to 455. In my heart there rings a melody, number 455. Stand as we sing. And we'll go ahead and let the kids go downstairs for junior church. I have a song that Jesus gave me. It was sent from heaven above. There never was a sweeter melody. Tis the melody of love. In my heart there rings a melody. There rings a melody with heaven's harmony. In my heart there rings a melody. There rings a melody of love. As Joy plays the next verse, we'll let the choir go down and you get around and greet one another this morning. And the last verse. It will be my endless theme in glory. With the angels I will sing. It will be a song with glorious harmony. When the chords of heaven ring. In my heart there rings a melody. There rings a melody with heaven's harmony. A melody of love. Amen. You may be seated. We come to our prayer time, and, and this is really one of the most important times of the service. When we go before the Lord as a body of Christ, 
and we lift up the concerns that we have to him. The number one thing on, on our prayer list this morning, as is always on the list that I'm sharing with you, we need to pray for the lost. I know I say that over and over again. I know that I say that every Sunday. But for a church that really needs to be right on the forefront of our thinking, it needs to be a burden on our hearts. It needs to be something that we take to the Lord daily. Lord, use me to bring someone to Christ. May my witness be strong. May my message be clear. And may other people be brought to Christ as a result of the life that I'm living in front of them and the words that I speak to them. So there is no greater thing that we can do in this world than to lead other people to Christ and to lead them out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light. And so let's make that right at the front of our prayers this morning. And of course, if there's someone here this morning that doesn't have a relationship with Christ, let's pray for anybody here. Uh, that may not have that. They may have some religion, they may have some relig religious uh, affiliation, that sort of thing, but they don't have a relationship with Jesus that has saved them and that has transformed their lives. And they need that. That's the only way to be accepted by God. And they're missing out on such a great deal. So let's, let's pray for them and ask for God to move in our congregation, but then also in our community and in our families and at work and wherever else it may be that people come to know Christ. And let's also pray for disciples to be made because when you come to Christ, that's not the end, that's the beginning of a journey of following after the Lord and learning more about him, uh, going to him in prayer, learning about his word, meeting together with his people, growing in character and grace. And so let's pray for discipleship efforts of this congregation, for the worship services, for the Sunday school, um, for the Bible studies that we have on Wednesday nights for the children's program we have, for Vacation Bible School that's coming up, uh, for the Experiencing God classes. Uh, let's pray for all of these uh, discipleship opportunities that God will work through them to increase our effectiveness in serving our Lord. Uh, we always want to be growing. We want to be learning. We want to be getting stronger in following him. We certainly don't want to be standing still. Uh, so let's pray that God kindle each one of our hearts in that regard as well. Uh, and then we want to pray for those who are ill. We've got a lot of folks in our church family that... That, that are struggling with various kinds of illness, uh, some that are struggling with cancer, um, and let's just pray for them that God would heal them. Pray for our military, uh, that God would protect them and bring them back to us quickly and safely. Uh, pray for other needs that exist in your families, uh, maybe any, even in your own life. Just list those, lift those things up to God, and as we cast our burdens onto the Lord, he's faithful to take care of us. So let's have a few moments of private meditation, and then after that we'll be led together in our prayer. Let's pray. ask that you would move and work in each one of our own lives and point us to Christ as we may get distracted with other things, we may get weighed down with cares of the past week or challenges that we've had. As we come here this morning, may our faith be renewed and strengthened. We pray, Father, for those who don't know Christ. We've been challenged to pray for at least three specific individuals. And Father, we lift those up to you now. You know their names. You know the folks that we have in mind. So we pray that your Holy Spirit would convict 
that you would open their eyes to the salvation that's available in Christ. And that they would realize that knowing Jesus and surrendering to Jesus is the only way that they have of, of experiencing eternal life. It's the only hope that they have of experiencing true life here and now. Father, we pray for many of us here who know Jesus that will continue in our Christian journey. May we never stand still. May we never be content with the things that we've learned or the things that you've done through us. Father, you've blessed us as a church in the past. And Father, we thank you so much for that. And we praise you for that. But may we never rest upon our laurels as individuals or as a church family. Because you have so much more for us to do. There are souls to be saved. There are lives to be touched. There are disciples to be made. And so, Father, may we be ready for the work. May we say, Lord, here am I. Send me. Use me for your glory and your honor and your majesty and to play a greater role in the kingdom of God and in the strengthening of this congregation. Forgive us of our sins, Father, especially where we've been complacent about the lost. But we just get so caught up with other things and and all the other temporal things of life that we lose sight of those eternal things such as folks coming to know Jesus father use us as your instruments may our lives be clear witnesses may others see Jesus distinctly in us and through the lives that we lead and the words that we speak may they be drawn as well to the Savior we pray father for all those who are ill in our congregation, touch them, grant healing to their bodies, and use us as agents of comfort and, and support and encouragement. We pray, Father, for our nation, that you would guide its leaders. We pray for our military personnel, that you would protect them and provide for them and bring them back to us safely. Father, we pray for unspoken requests that are here this morning. You know each and every heart. We lift those things up to you now, knowing that you care for us and knowing that you'll take care of us as we lean upon you. Speak to us now as we open your word, for it's in Christ's holy name that we pray. Amen. If you haven't already turned to Genesis 3, verses 1 through 7, please turn there now. Last week I had just returned from a church trip to the Ark Encounter uh, and, and the uh, Creation Museum uh, that's down in uh, northern Kentucky. And I was sharing a few things about the journey. And, and a couple of the things that I was sharing was, first of all, how very well-behaved Jack Taylor was on that trip as the youngest member of the group. And also about how very poorly behaved Terry Mayfield was, was as the oldest member uh, of the group. And despite his misbehavior and despite all the other things and despite the mischief that he created, everybody arrived back at Beulah safely. And so we're thankful for that. We had a great time of fellowship. We had a great time of learning. I particularly enjoyed the bookstore. I told you all about that last week. There was one at the Ark. There was another at the Creation Museum. So it was an especially good time of learning for me. And on the, next bet, on, on the bus ride home, I was thinking and praying about what I should preach in Genesis 3, 1 through 7 is what came to mind. And so Genesis 3, 1 through 7 is the account of the fall of man into sin. The original sin of this one man and this one woman, Adam and Eve, had a devastating impact on their lives, and it continues to have a devastating impact upon the entire world, upon the entire creation. So when you look around you, and when you see all of the suffering, when you read the negative headlines in the newspaper, on the internet, wherever it is you find your news, when you see the injustice, the natural disasters, the disease, and the death, keep in mind and know for sure it's not because of God. Now, in some insurance policies, if you've looked through your insurance policy for your home or whatever it may be, there will be a phrase in there describing things as acts of God. And 
one of the, some of the things that are described as acts of God as lightning striking and doing damage or a hailstorm moving through the area, and we don't know anything about that. So, but uh, all these different types of negative things that can occur from creation, and those are called acts of God. But really, that's not all that biblically accurate because we have all of these natural problems in the world today and disease in the world today and disasters in the world today because of sin. That's where it all came from. That's where it all originated. God made a perfect world without any of those destructive things. But what made, when he made the world, he gave man and woman dominion over it. And so when they sinned, when they fell out of fellowship with God and they were ensnared in sin, it affected the entire creation and it continues to affect the entire creation to this day. So be comforted in knowing that God's not standing by idly when, when there's children starving, when there's disease rampant, when there's all these different things occurring around the world. God is working to save this world from sin and he has sent his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross raised him from the dead on the third day, and through accepting Christ, you can be free from the sin in your life. And one day Jesus Christ will return bodily, and he'll make things all, as they should be, and he'll right all wrongs. So God is not behind the suffering. God is involved in the solution. And we need to ask ourselves the question today, will I submit myself to Jesus Christ and be a part of his solution for the world today, or will I continue to rebel against him? There's only those two choices that we have before us. So men and women, and as with all the creation, are continuing to suffer to this very day because of sin. It's that severe. It's that deep of a problem. It's because of that original sin in the garden and because you and I continue to make the choice to sin that everything is in the mess that it's in. So the next time you're suffering or you see hardship or sickness, don't blame God. He's not responsible. You are. And I am. God isn't part of the problem. He's part of the solution. So in the meantime, however, you and I have to deal with sin as it exists in the world. Last week you heard the first point that when man fell into sin in the Garden of Eden, there was a distortion of God's word. It happened then, and when people fall into sin now, more often than not, there's a distortion of sin. There's a misunderstanding of sin. There's a distortion, or there's a distortion of God's word. There's a distortion of God's word that causes people to fall into sin. And just as it happened in the Garden of Eden, so it happens now. There's a distortion of God's word, and that creates the sin, and that leads to the sin. It happened in the Garden of Eden. It happens when people fall into sin today. We follow the same pattern. So at the very beginning of temptation, God's word is distorted. So it's vital that you and I understand God's word clearly, that you and I know God's word well. Now, I've got a lot to say this morning, so I want to move fast. So try to keep up, and, and I'll be glad to give you some of the notes or whatever if you miss something. So, but there's a lot to say here, but we need to understand in our day and age that it's critical for church members and followers of Jesus Christ to be well-versed in Scripture. Amen. The rate of biblical illiteracy among churches is at an all-time high. That's why we have so many problems in churches and why we're teaching and allowing different things to creep into pulpits and con congregations and Sunday school classes and all of that. We teach all kinds of stuff that isn't biblical because we don't know God's word. So we need to understand it. We need to, underst we need to embrace that. The psalmist has said in Psalm 119, 11, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So when man fell into sin, there was a distortion of God's word. By hiding it clearly in your heart and by understanding it well and studying it well, it will not be easy for the enemy to distort God's word with you because you will understand it well. So that's the first thing that happened. There was a distortion of God's word. But that's not all that happened. So we go to the next two things in the message for this morning. First of all, when man fell into sin, there was defiance of God's will. There was defiance of God's will. Listen to verses 4 through 6. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. 
For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of his fruit and ate and also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. So first Satan asked the question, did God actually say and he's begun planting those seeds of doubt and distortion. Then he moves from distortion to defiance. You will not surely die if you eat of that fruit. God has it all wrong. He's just trying to take advantage of you. He's just trying to protect himself. He doesn't have your best interests at heart. He really doesn't love you. You've got to take care of number one, Eve. You've got to look out for you. And how often do we hear that same kind of message coming at us today from various sources so satan leads her towards defiance and then she considers it now this is a, this is a big step because you will be tempted today to to defy god to turn against him to go against what you know his clear will is you'll be tempted in that direction but before you actually do that you'll probably be considering that and these thoughts will be passing before you. You'll be tempted, and those everybody's tempted. Everybody has defiant thoughts. Everybody's tempted to do wrong. But the sin begins when you grab one of those thoughts and you begin considering it. Let me think about this for a second. Let me, let me, let me just give this a little bit of consideration. Maybe, you know, maybe this, this is something I need to, to give some attention to. That's when the wrong begins, when you begin sinning, when you begin considering that sin before you actually commit the act. And that's exactly what Eve does here. So she considers this whole thing. There's a principle here with Eve that's repeated over and over again in Scripture. You and I face it when temptation comes. There's a summary of it in 1 John 2.16. So now if you've got a Bible Bible, and by a Bible Bible, I mean one of these Bibles. So uh, you, know, you can just put your finger in Genesis 3 and then go over to 1 John 2.16. Um, I think everybody can do that. So now if you've got an electronic Bible, you're just going to have to skip and jump and move all around and that sort of thing. Uh, so, but look at 1 John 2.16. If you're taking notes, you want to write that passage down. So keep your finger in Genesis 3. Go over to 1 John 2, actually 15 through 17. We're going to look at three verses. That passage says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in this world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Now the world in these verses doesn't mean the created order. God created everything is good. We've already covered that. But the world is the frame of mind and it's the style of living that's independent of God, that wants to do its own thing without God, and claims even to know more about living than God does himself. So do not love that way of life that is in rebellion against God. And then in verse 16, John describes how the world appeals to, to believers, how it draws them. The desires of the flesh, first of all. The things that make you feel really good, that you know are going to make you feel good. The desires of the eyes, the second thing, the things that look really good. And then third, the pride of life, the things that make you feel better about yourself than you really ought to feel. Now, you will be tempted to defy God in each one of those areas. Now, there's nothing wrong at all with feeling good physically. There's nothing wrong at all with appreciating beauty in something or something that looks good. There's nothing, good, there's nothing wrong about feeling good about yourself as being made in the image of God. That's all okay. But, but remember this and catch this point. The sin comes when you deliberately place one or more of those things above God's will for your life. So when you're more concerned about feeling good than you are about pleasing God, that's sin. When you're more concerned about getting that person or thing that has caught your eye than obeying God and following his will for your life, that is sin. When you're more concerned about exalting your own ego than you are about exalting Jesus Christ, then you've gone the wrong direction. And you see all three of these things with Eve. So let's go back now to Genesis 3, 6. So 
When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired, she took of its fruit and ate. Now look here, it was good for food. It would make her feel good. It was a delight to the eyes. It looked delicious. Now, I don't know what kind of fruit this was, but it looked delicious. It was to be desired to make one wise. It stroked her ego, and it made her feel like that she was on a plane equal to God. So the distortion moves to defiance, and she deliberately makes the choice to rebel against God. Now, one of the first things many people say when they're tempted is they couldn't help themselves. I've heard that again and again. I've said that to, to God. Um, does anybody remember the comedian Flip Wilson? Anybody remember? Some of you, are not, you don't want to raise your hand because it'll show how old you are. So, uh, but I remember Flip Wilson. I'll admit it. I remember Flip Wilson. I don't have any hair anymore anyway, so I, I'll admit it. So he had his own television comedy show in, in the early 70s. He's the one that coined the modern use of the phrase, the devil made me do it. And so if you've heard that phrase, the devil made me do it, he's, he's the one that kind of started that, at least in modern usage. But the very nature of temptation is to make a choice. It's not to be compelled to do something, it's to make a choice. When you make that choice, you are responsible for the choice you make. Now, now, get this straight. If you're forced to do something, it's not a temptation anymore. It's coercion. And that's not what Satan does with you. He never coerces you. It's always temptation. It's always trying to trick you, fool you, to, to dupe you into making a choice that's in rebellion and defiance against God. So when you say that the, it was, the temptation was just irresistible, I just couldn't help myself, that's not true. That's not the nature of temptation. Temptation always involves a choice of your free will. Satan didn't force Eve to do anything. And he doesn't force you or me to do anything today. It's always a matter of temptation. It's always a matter of lying. So when you defy God, because you made the choice to sin, you alone are responsible for it because you made that choice choice later in genesis 3 both adam and eve try to shift responsibility for their sin to someone else but it didn't work adam is basically saying uh, uh god is this woman you gave me she's responsible for all this he didn't acknowledge the fact that she needed to be tempted and he didn't he just ate uh, and so but eve was, was saying it was basically the serpent's part you put him here in the garden and and, and it's all all the serpent's part, uh, fault so but that's not the case you and I can't shift blame for our sin. It solely rests on our shoulders. There were consequences for their defiance then, and there are consequences for your defiance of God now. Very severe consequences. Sin never, ever, ever pays. You always get a raw deal when you defy God's will. Adam and Eve paid a horrible price in the garden, and there is a horrible price to be paid today. Now, some of you folks may be thinking, well, pastor, you're getting kind of negative here, and this is, this is not really a pick-me-up sermon, and I came to church to be picked up, and I feel kind of put down and said, well, if you feel convicted, don't sin. Stay close to God. Don't rebel against him. Don't defy him. Get as close to him as you possibly can. Now, I realize that we're all imperfect and we're all struggling. We all need strength. So just draw closer to him in the midst of those times that you're struggling and allow him to empower you. But don't go rebelling against God because that will always involve heartache and pain. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in Galatians 6. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but for the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. You simply cannot defy God and get away with it. And you certainly can't shift blame to someone else. That won't work either. But we live in a, in a day and age where everybody's shifting blame. I mean, you thought it was bad in the Garden of Eden. It's even worse now. But if you insist on playing the blame game, with, with, uh, with, with your sin, blaming your parents, 
well, it's just the way I was raised. My, I had this parental influence. I mean, it's really, it's, it's genetic with me. And so I just couldn't help myself. But we get back to this idea of sin being a constant choice. So that doesn't wash either. So, or you blame your spouse. What, she's just dragging me down, or he's just so oppressive, or whatever the case may be. Or you just blame your circumstances. It's your job, or it's, it's the people around you, or it's your kids, or, or whatever else. When you keep playing the blame game, it prevents you from finding true forgiveness and empowerment to conquer the sin that's in your life. Listen to what theologian D.A. Carson says. He said, unfortunately, victimization convinces men and women who should be looking for a savior to search for a scapegoat. After all, if I am not to blame for what I do, the cross is much ado about nothing. How hopelessly out of date does the sp old spiritual sound to us, not my mother or my father, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Victims do not need God, just a sympathetic therapist or a good lawyer. But the reality is, friend, that you have defied God and I have defied God through sin. And the only hope for you and me is through a crucified and risen Lord. Now, a therapist can give you some good counseling, but a therapist cannot save you from your sin. Now, also, a lawyer may give you some excellent legal representation, but your guilt before God remains. Only Christ can set you free. But you've got to come to God, and you've got to come clean, and you've got to say, God, I'm the one who has sinned. And once you realize that you have defied God, and you alone are to blame, it is only then that you'll be compelled to look to Jesus for forgiveness and restoration. When man fell into sin, there was a defiance of God's will. Then when man fell into sin, there was a devastation of God's world. That's the third point of the whole message, the second point for this morning. Devastation of God's world. Listen to Genesis 3, 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Immediately after they sinned, the devastation begins. They experienced shame. They knew they were naked. That wasn't a problem for them before. But now they know that they are naked. And so they begin withdrawing from one another. And they begin covering one another. And then they begin the process of hiding themselves, not only from one another, but also from God. They were created to be in fellowship with God. But now they begin drawing back. And they're hiding from God. And in verse 7, the devastation is just getting started. It spreads like a cancer throughout all of God's once perfect world, leaving nothing unaffected. Everyone and everything around them is touched and tainted by sin, and so it remains today. Now, we need to also understand there's no such thing as private sin or secret sin. Whenever you rebel against Almighty God, it affects everything and everyone around you. Now, there are many consequences of sin that are described here in this chapter and then throughout the rest of Scripture, and I don't have time to go into all those different consequences of sin today. But one thing that really stands out to me, because of Adam and Eve's sin, their children suffered. Now, that's just one of the things. There's many things, but that's one that really stands out. That's one particularly painful effect on their world. When you defy God today, the same is true of you it affects your kids it affects the children it affects your children so if you're saying well you know i really don't mind that much about taking my lumps for disobeying god that's, that's okay i mean i understand there's a price for sin i'll go ahead and pay the price because i'm really stubborn i want to do my own thing keep in mind it doesn't just affect you it affects the kids you love and it affects their kids and it has a, a ripple effect numbers 32 23 says Behold, you have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. In other words, others will eventually learn of it, and they'll be affected by it, and that includes your kids, the kids that you love, the kids that you cherish. Look what happens in the very next chapter, in chapter 4. Eve's son, Cain, murders her son, Abel. Now, where do you think all that? Because Cain was upset because his offering was not acceptable to God, and so he takes matters into his own hands, and he lashes out against Abel, and he kills him. 
Now, where do you think that tendency to take matters into one's own hands and do their own thing and defy God's will originated? Where do you think that all came from? It came from Adam and Eve. And don't you think it broke Eve's heart when she saw one of her sons rising up and killing the other? All that God had created and entrusted to Adam and Eve was devastated because of sin. And all creation today continues to be devastated because of their sin and because of your sin and because of my sin. When man fell into sin, there was devastation of God's world. Now, God could have stopped right there at that point, and he could have destroyed everything. And he would have been perfectly justified in doing so. Now, someone may say, well, that's just, they just ate a little bite of fruit. I mean, it's, it's really not that big a deal in the vast scheme of things. They defied Almighty God. And when you defy a holy, almighty God, there are always severe consequences to pay. The higher the rank of the person, the higher the individual is in status, the greater the penalty is for the crime that's committed. And these people, Adam and Eve, sinned against almighty God himself. And there's a deep price to pay. And when you and I defy the almighty God, even it may seem to be a little thing to you and me, there's a heavy toll to pay. So can you see the severity now of distorting and defying the word and the will of creator God? Things are so bad with the human race that, that God could destroy us all right now if he wanted to. And there's nothing that you and I could really do to stand up for ourselves in defense. God would be perfectly justified in that. You and I would receive the disease, we'd receive the destruction, we'd receive the death for our sins that is so very well deserved. God could have left us all go and not, done, not have done anything. But God in his mercy, God in his grace, provided us a means to deal with sin. He sent his son, Jesus Christ. Thank God for his grace and his mercy. No wonder John Newton, when he penned the song, Amazing Grace, was so moved by God's mercy and compassion because it is an amazing thing. We get from God what we don't deserve. Each one of us gets that as we turn from our sin and as we turn to Christ. The first hint of what God has in mind in response to this sin is found in Genesis 3.15 when he says to that lying, deceiving serpent these words i will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel there would be one who would come from the woman who would crush this serpent and overcome the power of sin and death and that person is jesus christ and he's here in this place this morning he's alive and he's able to touch and transform the lives of all of those who will call upon him the scripture says everyone who calls upon the name of the lord will be saved jesus although he was fully human he didn't defy god he didn't sin against god he lived a different way so Jesus comes into the devastation of a dying world and he offers new and abundant life to everyone who will turn to him. So why aren't more people turning to Jesus now? It's because they're still deceived. The God's word is still being distorted. The devastation is still taking effect. So we need to pray for others and ask that God would open their eyes and convict them of their sin and of the truth of following Jesus Christ. You may be here this morning and you need to know Christ as your Savior. And you've been rebelling against God, insisting on doing things your way rather than God's way. And that kind of defiance will get you nowhere. But if you will take responsibility for your sin, if you say, Lord, forgive me. I've sinned against you and I'm responsible for that sin. I receive now your gift of salvation in Jesus. Save me from my sin and give me the new life that only you're able to do. God will respond to that prayer and he'll do it now. If only you will ask God to move and to touch and to change your life. Will you do that this morning? Maybe you're struggling. Maybe you, you've defied God. You've, you've known the Lord in the past, but you're struggling. You're rebelling. You're, you're, you're going against God's plan, and you know it down deep inside. Will you say this morning, Lord, forgive me of my defiance. I come back to you. 
Give me your grace. Give me your mercy. Cleanse me from my sin and restore to me the joy of my salvation. When you pray that prayer, God will be faithful to be merciful and to cleanse you from your sin and empower you to follow him as you ought. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, this morning we thank you for the, the truth of your word that, that we all have sinned. We have defied you as almighty God and, and we see around us the, the devastation that's, that's been in this whole created order as a result of all that. Father, this morning we take responsibility for the sin that, that is ours. And we thank you for the free gift of salvation that's available in Jesus Christ. And we know that as we turn to you and as we say, Lord, forgive me of my sin and give me new life, that you're faithful to do so. And Father, we pray for those around us who may be lost, that you would touch their hearts and open their eyes to their need of the gospel. And then, Father, may we continue to grow and to understand and continue to progress so that we might be more effective in reaching out to others and bringing them to a knowledge of the Savior, bringing them out of the rebellion of sin and into submission to the living Lord. Father, we know that we can't accomplish that. We can't change anyone's life. We can't change our own life. But Father, we know that through the power of the gospel and through what Jesus Christ has accomplished on the cross for us and through his shed blood, that the deepest, darkest sin can be made white as snow. So Father, we present ourselves to you this morning. Cleanse us transform us, and then use us to be vessels of your good news to this world around us. For it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. You may be here this morning. You need to make a first-time decision for Christ. You may need to rededicate your life. You may want to come and express your desire to come into Beulah Baptist Church. But however God's leading you, don't resist. Don't, don't put that off. You won't get anywhere by doing that. The best thing to do when the Lord is calling you to obey is to obey. And as you do that, then God will work through you to be a blessing to others and give you a joy and a peace that you will not experience otherwise. Let's stand and sing, Pass Me Not. Number 235, we'll do the first and the last verse. Let's stand, please, as we sing. Jim Sweeney, would you close us in prayer, please?